a prison sentence if you kill him. Okay? There's a, there's a good reason. If there, and no other reason to not kill snakes is you can go to jail. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so these also eat other snakes. This is the largest snake native to the United States. These things can get, I think the biggest one is like 10 feet long, which is pretty big for you know, a colored snake. Uh, I'm going to use the rest of them real quick. I don't really care. I'm going to do a couple of pictures here. It's so beautiful one there. Look at the big old head on that one there. Yeah, they're, they call them indigo snakes because they're, they're generally like on a uniform black color, but the light reflects off them so well they look like a dark blue, purplish color. So, and they always, they generally have a red chin, at least this very. There is a variant um, made for like southern Texas and Mex Mexico area that is like almost a solid black. I'll just leave you that one real quick because that one's that's one of my favorite pictures. Yeah. You're going to enjoy that. You can smell the snake must and all that. I'll be right back in just a moment. Has anyone got any questions or anything like that on, on some of the stuff that Tristan's already talked about? Oh, okay. You got one up front. I was, I was wondering about the eyes. Did you see the round pupils versus the ones with the slits? Is that, I thought I had read something where it's, it's, if the uh, iris, I guess you could say, is slit. Typically, typically black resemblance have a slit as opposed to like a cat eye. Um, the thing is, one of the things that in the morphological society we encourage is if you don't, if you can't identify a pupil, even even if it's a snakes are very migratory. So even if, even if you do come across a venomous one, you're, you're actually probably better off leaving it alone unless it's impending or something like that. But the slit eyes are typically venomous and they're typically vipers. The coral snakes because they're not the same as vipers, are going to have round eyes. Um, the thing is, and I don't, know, I, I don't think Trust the Scott's been in this or uh, species yet, but coral snakes are their ground snake. Typically, you know, the only time you come, like recently we had so much water flooding, uh, that's usually when the ground, like a lot of the ground pairs will come up. So you'll see your legless lizards, your glass lizards, your coral snakes, those little ring neck snakes, all these little tiny things. They live in the ground. You walk in them the whole time. You never see them. They're doing their job. Until it rains, and it's, it's as inconvenient as for us, it's really convenient for them because then they come up out of the ground and now they're exposed to their predators. So, you know, imagine if you were like out in the middle of the ocean, you know, everything was eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, All right, nothing I forgot to mention. Um, so, these snakes, they're going to be the largest snake that you can find in the United States. It's native to Florida, like Florida's probably the only state that fully encompasses, but it's like part of South Alabama. Mississippi and Georgia, um, but it, it just has a very, um, well, they're, it's an endangered species, it's a habitat loss, they live in pine forests and stuff like that, and since everyone's cutting down pine forests, they don't have a place to live, and so, you know, that's the one I probably should have left you on. That is absolutely gorgeous. Look how beautiful that is. I just have, uh, they're dark, their eyes just kind of look dark and soulless, but they, oh my god, they're so beautiful. <clears throat> so here's something in, um, in uh, Georgia here, collecting, possessing, harassing, or killing these indigo snakes is a violation of the Federal Endangered Species Act, subject to state penalties. So, and if, obviously, if you don't know anything, yeah, if you're uncertain about identification regarding any patternless and black colored snake, just consider it an indigo snake, don't touch it. <laughs> Again, important to learn. All right, now we get to the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, see, this is where this is where my tools come in here. Okay, I don't like using these on non-venomous snakes. I just use my hands or a really large net. But um, let's go through it. Huh? You have dry bites, which they count for about one in three bites um, from from uh, venomous snakes. Generally, well, it's only for uh, fighters and stuff because they're the only ones capable of controlling their venom. Now, if you bit by like, like a coral snake or something like that, they always have a set amount that they inject anytime they bite. So, yeah, they just generally use this to fend off predators. Uh, it should still be taken seriously because, you know, you never really know if there is actually venom potentially injected. But you'll feel it, though. All right, get that in the next slide, I think. But um, yeah, it can be prone to infection because those fangs, they'll pierce really deep. Check. <clears throat> yeah, vipers only. Dot com. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so it's more common in the Echistrodons. Not going to try and make you remember that uh, scientific term, but uh, uh, copperheads and cottonmouths. Uh, 
Anyways. Then it's, okay, venomous bites. This is what you gotta worry about. It feels like two burning knives just sink into your skin. And immense pain, it just shoots all the way up. Like it bites you on the arm. You're gonna feel that go all the way up, like immediately. So, yeah, call 911. That's, that's the best uh, thing. Uh, if possible, identify the snake. Uh, you have to force yourself to remain calm. I know it's probably not a very calm experience, you know, having all that pain shoot through you like that, but uh, um, anytime the more your pain, heart beats, the more venom will circulate. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Question? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, is it a myth that you can, like, cut into the bite and then just suck the venom out? I'll get in that in just a second. Raise <laughs> 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 your vomit. <laughs> yeah. Do not try to suck the venom out. It does, like, it really just doesn't do anything. Like, the venom is so deep in there, and it, like, immediately starts to take effect. If, if you're doing that, it's just wasting time. You just need to call 911 immediately. Like, that is the best course of action. Yes? And one of the reasons you need to get in touch with, um, and this is one of the educational aspects of the Herpetological Society, there's very little antivenom actually kept in this area. The, all the antivenom <coughs> is kept in South Florida, so yeah, Miami. For, for them to get it here, it, it just take as soon as possible. But the thing is, is all the snakes like uh, in this area, all the venomous ones, um, death is highly unlikely from uh, like within the first several hours. Okay, so I mean you got long enough time. I mean the quickest death was I think uh, what was it like Eastern Diamondback I think, and the person died in two hours, and that was that was like extremely fast for a medical snake. So you have several hours in order to actually get to the hospital and have the pain and everything like that. However, you're going to be in, in excruciating pain the whole time. So that's, yeah, do not use a tourniquet. Okay, this is extremely important. Um, a lot of people think, okay, you tie it off, you'll restrict the, you'll restrict the venom from flowing. What you're doing is restricting fresh blood from going in there and antibodies and stuff from actually fighting off the venom. So you're just, you're just basically letting your arm rot that point. Yes. Um, uh, most field uh, guys will tell you do not ever use a tourniquet unless you are fully confident that person is not going to have you have a problem with you losing their arm or their leg uh, because once the tourniquet's applied it's it's unlikely they're going to save that arm or leg. Right. Um, you want to keep it level with your heart. Uh, if you hold it up, then it's just going to travel down. If you hold it down, then all your blood is just going to be stuck in there. So just try to keep it low with your heart. And so yeah, we're going to start off with the local snake species. The personal favorite slash least favorite uh, for these. <laughs> which, yeah, I hear those little, little pitter patter on the feet. It's so cute. <laughs> so, all right, the cotton mouth. This is <clears throat> probably the most common little snake you're going to find around here. Um, oh my god, I've seen so many of these things. Um, even here at Arcadia Mill, this is a really good place to find them. Because anywhere where there's like still water and stuff, um, that's just where they love to congregate. Uh, they do not like places with like fast water and rivers and stuff like that. But obviously they can still be found there. And they can be found inland as well. So, cottonmouth, water moccasin, I've heard some people call them trap jaws. But I think that's more of a Louisiana thing. So, that, you know. I know to buy you. So, <laughs> all right. Now, a lot of people really exaggerate the aggression of this species. They are not aggressive. Okay. I mean, only they're probably only going to bite if you step on them or if you grab them. I mean, you can literally stand over one. And I mean, don't do this, obviously, because you're still tempting <laughs> fate. But Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so not anymore, or. <laughs> Uh, my voice is starting to wane, sorry. I'm used to just giving like a 10, 15 minute college presentation. So this, going for an hour and 15 minutes, that's a, that's a little too much for me, but we're going to get through it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, they have all sorts of different defensive displays. Um, they gape their mouth open. It's like a bright white cotton color. It's the name. Um, they do vibrate their tails a lot, um, which non venomous water snakes will not do. So if you see a you know, thick snake that's living in the water and all that, and you see it start vibrating the tail, it's probably a water moccasin. 
or it could just be any other kind of thing. So again, I cannot say this enough times. Learn the uh, individual species. Yes. Is that the easiest way to tell a box from another snake if you're close to water? Um, it could be one of kind of the other reasons. They don't necessarily always vibrate their tail, but the one thing water moccasins um, are well, obviously they're famous for is they will open up their mouth and just gape at you. And generally their tails just kind of be flaying around left and right like that. And so they're they put on a show, but they're unlikely to bite you unless you're actually like physically contact, physical contact. So uh, the bites are very dangerous. Uh, you need to seek medical attention, like this is possible. Yes. Didn't most venomous snakes head bigger than their body, or non-venomous snakes head if they're smaller than their body? Uh, yeah, this, it's normally around the neck area where you'll see it, because like a, let's see if I can do like a really good shadow puppet show here, like sort of like that. Yeah, the head shape is kind of like this on the venomous snake. It's very rounded, and the neck would be like very small until it actually gets to the thicker body part. But a non-venomous or a non-venomous water snake is going to have a head kind of like this, but it does flatten it out to like, like a more perfect triangle. This kind of looks more like a, a spade, like a shovel, you know. But so it, you just kind of kind of learn to identify. Them, I guess I, I got a lot of pictures of these, so get ready for a, <laughs> a slideshow because I mean I have just so many pictures. These are they're very photogenic. Okay, what kind of say? No, no, these aren't. Like, like I said, these are just kind of basically pulled off the internet. I'm just trying to get the best pictures I can find. Um, I, I leave the watermarks in there for, you know, photographers to sit in there. So I don't want, I want to get to do all the legal work, right? <laughs> so, now the babies, a lot of people think these are copperheads, which they, they do look quite similar to copperheads because of the strong patterns. All water moccasins are like this whenever they're babies. They're, uh, they're these uh, bright, like orange or light colored brown color and all that. But uh, one thing that distinguishes them is they have a dark stripe going behind their eye, which copperheads do not have. Also, the pattern is really, really kind of blotchy and all that. I'll show you a copperhead, I think it's next up, which the patterns are very kind of uniform. Yeah, they, they do look they do look really mad, don't they? That's that's because of the scale. And another thing, if you look at a cotton mouth from above, well, hang on, there's, yeah, there we go. You cannot see their eyes if you're looking at it directly above. Now, with a non-venomous water snake, you are going to be able to see their eyes. But obviously, if you're trying to if you're trying to look directly down on them to identify them, you're probably too close. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't know what the snake is, just leave it alone and you know go about your day. Then you go to every other critter. <laughs> so uh, these actually have one of the most varied diets of any snake I think ever. I mean, they will eat fish, frogs, lizards, rodents, uh, other snakes. Uh, they'll actually they have been seen eating roadkill, like just parts of animals just strewn about on the highway. And they'll just come over there and they'll help themselves. So they have, uh, they can eat a lot of stuff. So there's one eating a frog. And there you can see the really intimidating colors here. Now another thing about uh, water moccasins in particular is their eyes. They have, they're very light colored at the top, but immediately dark colored at the bottom. So you see that on all of them here. But yeah, they'll rear up at you like this. I don't know, you, you get familiar with it if you see it a few hundred times like I have. There's a really good shot of a baby one. Um, yeah, all baby pit vipers. And, I don't know, is it for all vipers too, or just, just pit vipers? All vipers as well. Oh, okay, yeah. They have a, a little bright yellow tail whenever they're babies. And they actually wiggle that around like a worm to attract frogs and stuff like that. You so cute. Really oh, yeah, it's really cute. You want to pet them? <laughs> uh, unless he's defanged. <laughs> oh yeah, another thing about that. Um, if you try to defang a snake, that's not really going to help. Snakes shed their fangs as well. Like venomous snakes, they're going to shed their fangs like four or five times a year. And so you cut out the fangs and say, oh cool, I'm going to keep one, keep one as a pet. Which keeping a venomous snake as a pet is illegal without a license. Just make it clear. But 
they're going to grow those fangs back. And if you take out the venom glands, like through surgery or something, uh, the snake's going to die. So yes, that's, it is a digestive juice. That right. is what venom is. So when you, when you remove the venom from a, from a reptile that uses venom, you basically remove part of its stomach. Yeah, and that's, that's like, uh, that's the snake charmer's secret. Snakes say, oh, you know, play the flute and all that, and they can, they can hear. No, they're reacting to the swaying of the instrument. They can't hear anything. I mean, they have no ears. They only can sense like vibrations in the ground. And so they're just reacting to the movement. And a lot of them, just as a failsafe, uh, the snake charmers will cut out the venom glands and their fangs and everything. And so these snakes are just slowly dying while people are sitting there playing the flute toward them. So they're basically just playing the funeral music after they keep crap out. <laughs> so that's why you don't that's why you don't do snake charm stuff like that. Don't support any of that. But yeah. They wiggle the tail and that's that's even for rattlesnakes, but uh, once they start getting little rattles building up, you can't really see it so much anymore. They don't fade out whenever they get older, but uh, that was a good one there. And I saw one of these and I would not want to be the photographer. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you could have had a good zoom. You could have been like, could have been on stilts. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, you can't discount any possibility, right? <laughs> but yeah, I, I've seen this uh, at one point. I was walking through the brush. I, did, I wasn't even really paying attention at that point, which I should have. And I was walking through some brush, and this thing, I had tall snake boots on. You know, snake, they're like tall boots that have like plastic lining and stuff on the inside that prevent the snake's fangs from getting in there. But one of them was just sitting right here. As soon as I put my foot over there, it kind of it opened its mouth and just kind of gave a little jump like that, you know, because they aren't actually striking at you at the time. They're just kind of jumping at you to get you to flinch and run away. So they're not, they're like, they're not aggressive, but they will, they will act like it. There's another really good one. That, that is my favorite picture for them. So I say, that, say this for the last. Like I said, I have a bunch of pictures of these. Like this isn't even half of them. <laughs> so yeah, you see the you see the fangs come out on. Oh, that's so cool. And you see the bright line in the mouth. But yeah, they, they kind of curl up. They got the tail going, going like that and stuff. Uh, you can't see it here, but yeah, the tail's always shaking when they're doing this. They just, they just look really neat. But they're not so neat. Okay, so copperheads. These are, yeah, not really found uh, this far south, but they are more common up north. Uh, actually, they're the most common venomous snake um, pretty much in the United States. But they're just, it's usually from the north. So, anyways, these are interesting. They actually eat bugs as well. There's one eating a cicada. It's one of their favorite little snacks, you know, those loud things up in the trees screaming during the summer. Uh, it eats those, so. Your, your ears will have to thank that snake. <laughs> Anyways, these are really not aggressive. Like these, you're literally just going to have to grab them or be hurting them in order for them to actually react. These, they really just sit there for days at a time waiting for something to pass by. And of course, the babies also have a little yellow tail that they wiggle around to attract prey. Um, the bites on these are not lethal. There's only been one fatality ever recorded and that was like a child or something so uh, and you know like a weak immune system could be looking at life threatening but generally you only need like first aid treatment and stuff but it can still cause some severe tissue damage and a lot of pain it's like 10 hornets stinging you in the same spot you know probably gonna live through it but it's gonna be it's gonna suck <clears throat> but yeah notice um, their eyes are all like the same color they're not um, they're not like light and then dark like that. Um, uh, water rocks, sorry. And they lack the big dark stripe on the eye. And they retain their pattern even when they're adults. So that's how you can tell. You see a rather large, rather large snake that has has patterns and everything inside. It's like one would be not a water moccasin. People actually see um, jet black water moccasins, but that is extremely rare. Like. That is a, a very rare variant. Like people think, if you see a black snake, that's you know, it's a water moccasin. No, uh, a solid black water moccasin is. Uh, uh, I can't think of anything to compare it to. It's really rare. So it's yes, like how some you with all the humans only have this many have a blonde hair, but this many have black hair. Yeah, well, like that. It's it's like a, I guess it's a recessive trait if, in genetics and all that. Recessive. 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 Sorry, I got to get tongue-tied. Anyways, 
I'm talking for like around half people. Give me a break. Anyway, so yeah, these these actually um, they're I wouldn't say social, but they're not going to eat each other like a water moccasin or king snake or something like that. And actually, these will shelter in hibernation with rat snakes and rattlesnakes and stuff like that. So they all be found in the same den. And here you see an adult and then uh, three little babies here with their bright little tails. It's so adorable. I'd love to have one of these as a pet. That's what you said. <laughs> so one day I just come home with 20 of them. <laughs> I mean, I gotta get my license, so I'll change the box on something else. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll stuff in the other. Okay. Um, okay. So timber rattlesnakes. They're the most common rattlesnake in uh, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, their bites can be lethal, but they are also not an aggressive species. Like these, these are probably one of the least likely rattlesnakes to actually bite you. Um, and they're also not exactly aggressive enough to even start rattling their tail. So that's, you know, they miss out on that little warning sense. So again, if you're out hiking, you're stomping your feet. That'll scare everything off. It'll alert the snakes. They'll try and get out of your way before you even see them. So, let's see. A lot of the pictures I found of these are really blurry, but they all have the same sort of uh, like brown tan color with uh, little zigzag dark stripes going across and then uh, an orange line going down. And the tails are always black. The head is unmarked. They're pretty little babies. So, anyways, pygmy rattlesnake. Now, these are fun. Uh, Notice they also have very similar pattern to the southern hognose snake, so, and they're about the same size and everything else too. But the thing is, these do not puff up their neck and everything like hognose snake would, so I guess that's a good way to identify them. But yeah, they have like the same pattern and everything too. But as you can see, they could be really small. There's a baby one next to a quarter, so yeah, very tiny. And you can even see the yellow tail on this one as well. So these are aggressive, you know. Something about you know small creatures being very aggressive. You know, you ever seen a chihuahua? I mean, come on, those things are little devils. <laughs> but yeah, um, they are dangerous. Even though they have a very, even if they inject all their venom, it's not much, but it's extremely powerful. And their rattle is very faint, so it's difficult to hear. It sounds like a little, like that little insect buzz. So, but then again, if you have if you have tall boots or even just even jeans on. You know, they're not likely to get through that. Yeah. You're cute, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's your opinion, and it's wrong, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, coral snake. That's a fun one. These things, I mean, look how gorgeous they are, though. I mean, sure, they're, sure they're deadly, but I mean, look how pretty they are. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of beautiful things are deadly. Uh, have you seen women before? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm not messing with you, but uh, all right. These are not aggressive. They're extremely shy. Um, they're really reclusive. These are only found, you know, like like you said, underground, like under bark, and leaf, under bark leaves, stuff like that. So they feed almost exclusively on lizards and small snakes, even though they themselves are quite small. Uh, I think three feet is like the maximum they can get. So yeah, they have a very vibrant color. Um, I think. The, one thing I've noticed is they're very iridescent, like they will shine with a purplish color across their whole body, as well as their uh, their patterns down here are like are like blood red and stuff with an orangish color, like a, the harvest ones. Every time I look at it, and if I look at a picture of a snake or something, a lot of people will just go, ah. but my reaction to snakes is kind of like most people's reaction to a puppy or a kid. So, <laughs> Eastern Diamond Bay. And it's going to be the last one on the list because these are just, these are, uh, that's what we're most famous for. Like, these are strictly um, found in like just Florida and the very, very far southeastern part of the United States. Um, they are the largest rattlesnake, uh, the largest venomous snake native in North America. And they can get about eight feet long. Uh, I just, I do want to point out something though. You'll see a lot of pictures going around social media of people with these rattlesnakes that look like they're 15 feet long, something like that. That, that's, they're holding it up to the camera. You know, like people do it, they catch a fish. They want to hold it up to the camera, make it look a lot bigger. It's not optical illusion. They do not get that big. So don't worry. They're only going to get maybe, on average, you're probably seeing about five feet long. And that's, that's probably about as big as I can get. How big was the one you saw the other day? Uh, 
Yeah, so that was probably about as big as I mean, most people just kill them on site anyway, so they, you know, they don't even really get a chance to get to the maximum length. Um, they can strike over distances like half their body length, and they can be kind of aggressive. So, but they are very good at making themselves known. So, like if you start walking up on them, they're gonna shh like that. That was probably the best battle sound I've ever made. <laughs> I mean. This is actually a, one from the Eastern Diamondback that uh, my dad actually killed several years ago. And it was at a bus stop and also, um, that was a time when I actually didn't like snakes. Believe it or not, that, that was a thing at one point. But, uh, but yeah, so it's really hard because they vibrate so fast, I can't actually like, yeah, it's, it's a lot faster and louder than that. So and it's just, I don't know, you can look at that and all that. Trying to break it, it has one down. But yeah, I'll have it a little tough here and see it right here. Um, let's see. Uh, they're only found in the southeast. Um, they are on drastic decline because of like rattlesnake roundups, which I'll uh, have a whole subject on that in a moment. And they are absolutely beautiful. These things, they will like expel musk usually whenever you get near them as part of their defense. And so this is where a lot of people will start saying they smell like a wet goat. Like these are these are the main culprits for that. I mean, this is, they are absolutely beautiful, I think. Right. Anyways, so rattlesnake roundups. There's a little, little subject I'd like to talk about. It's more common in the West because that's, you know, where the highest concentration of rattlesnakes tend to be. Uh, small scale roundups are in Florida, uh, just because the Eastern are not back. Uh, not bashing Bitco, but they have a little thing out there they'll pay you to have uh, rattlesnakes taken in. <coughs> that they're killed and all that stuff. Uh, it only has negative effects on the environment. Like I said, every snake has its role in the ecosystem, venomous or not. So killing them is just a bad idea all around. You leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. That's, that's the whole purpose. Another thing I forgot to mention here at the beginning of, this, of the slideshow was um, almost every single venomous snake bite, or well, any snake bite in general, is uh, just people playing with them, really. Like they're intentionally disturbing them. Uh, the only other small percentage of bites is people that accidentally pick something up, you know, and the snake just happens to be under there, and you just scare them. Like you reach your hand up underneath the board or something like that, and just lift up, tries to get you. But which is why snake handlers use one of these. You know, you pick it up like that, so it's not going to just jump out and get you. So let's see. A vast majority of capture snakes are killed or thrown out like trash. Um, there are a couple of myths that, they, that uh, people who run these, they'll say, uh, well, you know, we're using them for food. Some of them are used for food, but most of them are just thrown out. Um, and other people are like, well, we're, we're uh, getting the venom out of them to make, you know, to make serum to, to heal people. It's like, it's not professionally extracted. They just shove them over a bottle or something like that, and the venom's not able to be used in any sort of medical field. And it has to be done by a professional in a sterilized environment and everything like that. So. They're, they're just killing snakes just because they're coming up with excuses trying to make everyone happy. Good thing. Which I Hmm? Go say something. I said, I said it's just like coyote killing. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, they use uh, barbaric practices like sewing the mouth shut so people can handle it and all that. They'll cut out the fangs, the venom glands, and everything like that. And so the snakes are just suffering and dying. And I've seen some of them actually. They'll sew up the snake's mouth and then release them. And so they just starve to death because they can't eat. That's like TV of a crocodile. Yeah, I know. It's like, can you imagine if someone sewed the mouth of a dog shut? Can you imagine the absolute hysteria of uproar across the world? All right, they do it with snakes all the time, but no bats and I. No. Uh, here's a rattlesnake roundup in the west. As you can see, they just gather as many rattlesnakes as they possibly can. They throw them in a pit. And then they kill them. I think this here is like a shotgun uh, ring or something like that. I guess everyone stands around and shoots them or something. But uh, anyway, so a couple more images that I have from this. Uh, if you're easily disturbed, this might not be the best time to look. So uh, I'm going to be putting this slide in three, two, one. Everyone seems to be good with it. So, all right. So someone, yeah, you still have the mouth shut. If I hit my hands on the person that did this, you know, I'd be in prison, so that probably wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, I saw it the mouth shut, and it's just, 
this is, this is terrible. And here's a garbage bag full of snake heads. Do not take that crack out. <laughs> it's evident also those heads would still bite. Yeah, they came, so that's, that's the interesting part. Um, yeah, they just, they just throw them out like this. And, you know, some of them are cooked up and eaten, but I mean, it's primarily the main reason people don't like them. It's so it's like, yeah, they actually go out into the desert, like, in mass teams to sweep the area, and just, they catch every rattlesnake they see. And it's like, you're going out into their territory getting them. It's like, I mean, I'm not one of those, you know, animal rights freaks or nothing like that, but when I see something like this, it makes my blood boil. So, anyways, the lesson to learn after all this. Snakes are vital to the ecosystem. Doesn't matter if they're venomous or non-venomous. Uh, no snake wants to bite people out of mouths. Now, they do have thermal regulated uh, body temperatures, but they don't bite cold blood. That's a joke. <laughs> yeah, that's <funny>. very good. <laughs> I have been playing that. Two weeks. <laughs> but yeah, um, let's see. Snakes should be respected and not feared. Again, got to try and try and take time out, learn the individual species, and I honestly think that this should be taught as early as like elementary school. Right? People need to grow up learning about this stuff so they don't become you know snake killers in the future. And actually, the eastern diamondback is they're, they're debating on whether or not to put it in like in a threatened species or a protected species group now because of people are killing them so much. Um, that's the end. Thank you, everybody. Don't forget the rats of the economy. They keep the rats out, so that's great. So yes, you're protecting yeah. the economy. Oh yeah, this is one thing. I actually did several of my uh, like final exams in like uh, I guess my public speaking class. Then I had a, a writing class that I had to uh, make a presentation and stuff for. And of course, I did about both on snakes. And that slideshow is actually a drastically improved version of those original slideshows and everything. So, I, I that, was, that was like a 90% increase or something. So, anyways, uh, there's I read this one story that I used for one of my uh, speeches, and there was a dog pound owner. Uh, I think it was in South Florida, but he kept on finding snakes living up in the rafters of the dog house, and they were just you know, harmless rat snakes, like the ones I have in there. And he was like, you know what, these snakes could be potentially dangerous. I need to, so he went out there and, you know, he caught them and he killed as many as he could possibly find. It wasn't but two weeks later, the place started getting swarmed with rats and mice. And the, they would eat all the dog food. Uh, some of them would even bite the dogs and the dogs would get infections and stuff like that. And of course they're, you know, they poop and pee everywhere. So, I get to kept pet rats or something. You know how bad that is. You gotta always have something to pick up after them. And uh, it was just an absolute disaster. They had to get all the dogs out of there. Um, 